Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. And I don't know what I did with that story. 888-589-8840 is the number to call. Here we go. This is what I was looking for. I got a couple of stories on the issue of homosexuality before we go to the phones. Uh, you know, and this is a this is an observation that people have made a number of times that if homosexuality were genetic, it would have been bred out of the human race long ago for the simple reason that homosexuals cannot reproduce. So that genetic trait would simply disappear because it could not possibly pass, be passed on through the act of procreation. I'm looking at a piece here today from the BBC basically saying the same thing. And I just want to stress this with you. Do not miss this because this is not being written by Christians. This is not coming from a conservative standpoint. This is on the BBC and it quotes Darwinian evolutionists. And they're puzzled by this. This is a problem for them. Do not miss the significance of this. Darwinian evolutionists have no explanation for the rise or the perpetuation of homosexuality from an evolutionary perspective. Here is Paul Vasey, University of Lethbridge in Canada. You will note that's not Moody Bible Institute. That's not Bob Jones University. That's not Liberty University. That's the University of Lethbridge in Canada. Paul Vasey, Darwinian evolutionist. This is a paradox from an evolutionary perspective. The fact that you even have homosexuality in 2014. How can a trait like male homosexuality, which has a genetic component, he's just making that up because there's no evidence there's a genetic component at all. In fact, the whole point of the piece is there can't possibly be a genetic component. It's an anomaly from an evolutionary standpoint. But he says this, how can a trait like male homosexuality, which has a genetic component, persist over evolutionary time if the individuals that carry the genes associated with that trait are not reproducing? This is an evolutionist saying this. Next sentence, scientists don't know the answer to this Darwinian puzzle. They have no answer. Do you remember how many times in that debate with Ken Ham, Bill Nye, the science guy, had to say, I have no clue. I've got no idea. Uh, where did the atoms come from that made up the Big Bang? I have no idea. That's a mystery. Looking forward to finding out someday. Uh, how did life arise from matter? I have no idea. It's a mystery. I hope to find out someday. Where did consciousness come from? I have no idea. I'm looking forward to finding out someday. Uh, and here you ask the same scientist, how do you explain uh, homosexuality? If it's genetic, how do you explain the fact that it's still around? We have no idea. Looking forward to finding out someday. All of these major questions, they have absolutely no answer for. Why? Because they are fools. Remember, uh, Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So anyway, uh, th that's our Fisher factoid today. You got these evolutionary scientists, they're admitting on the BBC that they have no answer to the question of why we even have homosexuality if it is genetic in nature because the, gene the genes that would perpetuate it cannot be uh, transmitted through reproduction should have disappeared eons and eons uh, ago. All right, let's grab some phone calls. Uh, let's go. Let's start with Terry in New Albany, Mississippi. Terry, welcome. What's on your mind? Thank you, yes. I want to say I totally disagree with Andy Stanley. Now, here's the question I think every Christian ought to ask. Would Jesus Christ perform a gay wedding? And and if they say yes, I think they just need to repent and and, and call on Jesus because he said man shall leave his, his parents and be joined to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Well, I don't know. I, I think we just need some, some good old born-again, blood-bought preaching and teaching from the Word of God and, and all this liberal talk and, and everything trying to compromise and pacify everybody. We need to get back to what the Bible says. All right, Terry, I'm, I'm in sympathy with you on that. I, I agree with it. You know, and I think maybe the more basic question, we actually invited Andy Stanley to come on this program. I don't believe he will, but 
We, we've invited him to come on this program and talk about these comments. You know, the more basic question, even more basic, well, I mean, maybe it's not more basic than the question, but, but a more relevant question today would be to ask Andy Stanley, would you do a gay wedding? And if Andy Stanley would say, no, I would not officiate at a gay wedding, and you ask him why, and he says, well, I don't want to participate in that kind of a wedding ceremony because of the moral standards of Scripture. Then you say to Andy Stanley, well, how in the world, and if you won't do it on the basis of conscience and Christian conviction and biblical standards, how in the world can you condemn a Christian baker for doing exactly the same thing that you're doing? Uh, that's a, that's a talk about offensive. That's a pretty offensive uh, double standard. All right, Terry, thanks for the call. I appreciate that. Uh, let's go to Ricky, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ricky, welcome. What's on your mind? Uh, yes, I want to make a couple of comments, what you're talking about. Uh, actually, Joel Osteen has the largest full gun, or actually the largest church in North America, and the homosexual community uh, paid a visit to his office one time trying to get him to say, hey, why don't you just say it's okay, you know, uh, to be, uh, it's okay to be gay? And he, I'll kind of, kind of paraphrase, but the end result was, hey, if uh, God calls it sin, I call it sin. The Bible calls it sin. If you don't like it, hit the road, buddy. Take a hike. That's what he told the homosexual <laughs> community, that homosexual is a sin. Tough. You don't like it, get out of here. But yeah. anyhow, uh, of course, he said it nicer terms than that, of course. But um, uh, Andy, uh, he's either heretic, ignorant of the Bible, or he's backslidden, or he's a uh, uh, sodomite sympathizer, meaning usually people are soft on whatever sin that is, adultery, fornication, I mean, they might be a participant themselves, you know, and that, and then Kristen uh, Powers, she's either a backslidden or a heretic herself, too. So, you know, they, they're either ignorant, backslidden, or reprobate concerning yeah. the Word of God. All right, All right. well, listen, I, I appreciate the call, Ricky, and I think with Kirsten Powers, I, I think she is, she's just a very young believer. She has not been a Christian for very long, and my impression is she's gotten no good Bible teaching. So she just, just has not been given any depth or grounding in the Word of God. Andy Stanley... Yeah, he doesn't have that excuse. He comes from a good line, theology of his father, very solid Charles Stanley. And, you know, it, it's hard not to think that maybe the problem here, and, I'm, I, you know, again, I, I'm not going to speculate specifically about Andy Stanley because I don't know his heart, but I know human nature. I know my own black heart, and I know that it's very tempting to want to say the thing that you believe will cause certain people to say nice things about you and will make you look good when people read the story uh, and they hear uh, all of that. So I think this motivation to have all of the wrong people say nice things about you is a very, very powerful uh, a, a sort of a trait in, uh, in, in all of us, and it can get to Christian leaders just like it can get uh, to you and me. Nobody likes to have hateful, hurtful things said about them. I don't enjoy that. Nobody likes that. You know, if, if you, you were asking for that, there'd be something sadistic and, and something psychologically misformed for anybody would look for that and try to provoke that and try to trigger it, get some kind of pleasure out of it. Uh, so it doesn't feel good, but if the alternative to, to being the object of that, that kind of treatment is to compromise on the truth, well, you can't do that. If you're a follower of Christ, you can't do that. You know, and Joel Osteen has been kind of a wandering star on this issue. He was on Larry King, and he said, well, look, I don't really understand anything about homosexuality, so I'm not going to preach about it. You know, uh, he might have said what he said to these gay activists. Good for him if he did. But on national television, or maybe it was Piers Morgan, but one of those, he said, uh, what was that, Jeff? Well, it was Larry King, or I think this latest time was Piers Morgan, just not too long ago. Uh, he said it on Larry King before, and he's also said it on Piers Morgan. And what he said on Piers Morgan's show, I think, is, well, uh, you know, I don't really understand a lot about homosexuality, so I'm just not going to preach on it. So his... His, his uh, way of dealing with it is just to avoid the topic altogether. Now, I think Andy Stanley, I think it's too late for him. He should have referred this to one of the pro-family organizations that deal with the issue of the public expression of Christianity every day. Should have referred the issue to them. Didn't do it. Too late for that, but it's not too late for him to issue an apology to the church for his alarmingly misguided pastoral advice. Let's go to Jerry, Gulf Shores, Alabama. Jerry, welcome. What's on your mind? Hello? Yes, Jerry, you're on. Go right ahead. Uh, okay, hey, Brian, and um, I just want to make this clear before I start. I am a born-again Christian. I listen to y'all all the time, and I will continue. I do disagree with uh, Andy Stanley. I think we should not participate in things that, that the Bible calls sin, 
But I also have to uh, say what Tim Wildman said one day about cults. It's been in the last six months. And he was interviewing a man that wrote a book about cults. And when it got to Mormonism, Tim actually just sort of cut him off and made him quit saying that Mormonism was a cult because Tim knew some. And he thought they were nice people. So that's that's like a double standard, and I say that in love. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and I, I didn't hear that exchange, and that would be an issue really for uh, for you to take up with, with Tim. Uh, well, I and, thought he might be there since he, you interviewed him, but but y'all can go back and check that. It's on there. Yeah. Well, I don't think, you know, the, uh, we're not under any illusion about the theological differences between Mormonism and Christianity. We don't paper those over. We don't pretend they don't exist. I think it's more a matter, Jerry, when it comes to the issues that we're trying to see movement on, say on the issue of, of marriage, Mormon, the Mormon church have, has been our allies in that battle. They've stood side by side with us. In fact, I would suggest that Proposition 8 in California passed because of the influence and the work of the Mormon church. So where we have common cause, where we have some moral issue that affects our culture, and we agree with the Mormon church, then we want to work side by side with them. Uh, and, and we don't want to rupture that working relationship by overemphasizing the theological differences between us, which are there. We don't paper them over. We don't pretend that they do not exist. I mean, there's a chasm of theological difference between us and uh, the LDS Church. Uh, their view of Christ is not an orthodox view. Their view of the Trinity is not an orthodox view. Their view of the Scriptures is not uh, orthodox. But we do want to work with them, with all like-minded people, where we have common cause. All right, Jerry, listen, I appreciate your call. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll be right back after the news. Stay with us. Focal Point AFR Talk. Talk. 